Hello, today we're continuing in our GCSE Physics Revision series, starting a new topic on atomic and nuclear physics. And we're starting with atomic structure. And we have to go back to about 400 BC for a debate between two Greek philosophers. It was Democritus versus Archimedes. Now the debate was basically this. Suppose you took a chunk of something, could be anything, let's call it a plank of wood, and you cut it in half, and then you take this half, and you cut that in half. And then you take this half, and you cut that in half. You get the general idea, you keep cutting in half. The question that was occupying the minds of Greek philosophers was, could you keep doing that ad infinitum, or would you eventually come to a point where you couldn't do it anymore? Leave aside the worry that you may not have an instrument that allowed you to cut something in half, but forget about that. In principle, could you do it? Now, Democritus was of the view that you would eventually get to something that was indivisible. You couldn't cut it in half anymore. And he called that atomos, which means indivisible, and from which we get the word atom. Archimedes, on the other hand, was having none of that. His view was that whenever you cut something in half, you always have half left. So you should, in principle, be able to continue to cut something in half forever and ever. Archimedes was the more famous of those philosophers, so his view prevailed. His view that you could keep cutting things in half forever and ever prevailed until basically the 18th and 19th centuries. And it was really the chemists rather than the physicists who started to change the debate. In particular, a man called John Dalton in 1804. It had been well known for centuries that there were elements. Some examples would be gold, silver, iron and lead. These were known about. And the thing that was known about these elements was that you couldn't make those elements from other elements. One of the main occupations of the alchemists of the Middle Ages was to try and take a base metal like lead and convert it into gold. But they couldn't do it. They were all different, but you couldn't make one from another. However, you could combine them. For example, you could take an sodium, which is a highly toxic, highly poisonous, highly reactive substance, and combine it with chlorine, which is a highly toxic, highly reactive, highly poisonous substance, and you could bring the two together and manufacture sodium chloride, which is another name for table salt, the stuff you're perfectly happy to put on your fish and chips. Two very poisonous substances come together to manufacture something that flavours food. And the chemists concluded that there had to be some basic constituent of sodium and some basic constituent of chlorine that came together and joined up and formed a new compound. And those basic constituents they called atoms. And the idea was that each atom would be the same for any given element. So for example, all gold atoms would be the same, but they would be different from all silver atoms, which would be different from all iron atoms or all lead atoms. So all atoms of a particular element are the same, but they are different from the atoms of other elements. And here's the key point. They concluded that, as Democritus said, that atom could not be divided in half. They didn't know why, but that was the basic premise. Now along comes a physicist, J.J. Thompson in 1896, and he did an experiment with hydrogen atoms. And he found from this experiment that he got something that had a negative charge. Now, the one thing that was known about these atoms was, or elements, was that they were neutrally charged. They had no positive or negative electric charge. They were entirely neutral. Yet J.J. Thompson found something that was negatively charged. He concluded that that negatively charged thing, which today we now know is an electron, 
must have come out of the atom. And if a negatively charged thing came out of the atom, then what must be left behind would have to be positively charged so that when the negative charge and the positive charge were together inside the atom, they would be overall neutral. The negative charge would balance the positive charge and the whole atom would be neutral. And this gave rise to what became known as the plum pudding model of the atom. Now, if you don't know what a plum pudding is, uh, you might instead understand a current bun. A bun which is made of dough in which there are fruits called currants or raisins. And the idea is that the dough is the positively charged bit of the atom and the individual currants are the negatively charged bits of the atom. J.J. Thompson had worked out that the mass of the negatively charged bit was equal to only one two thousandth of the mass of the positively charged bit. So the mass of the negatively charged bit is hugely smaller than the mass of the positively charged bit. So there's only a few negative bits inside a massive positive bit. But the charge on the negative bits is equal to the charge on the positive bits so that the two cancel out to make a neutral atom. But the plum pudding or current bun model only lasted a few years until the early 1900s when a man by the name of Ernest Rutherford working together with his um, students Geiger and Marsden you might recognize the name Geiger uh, he, he developed the so-called Geiger counter which is a means of measuring radioactivity but Rutherford took what was known as a radioactive substance we'll learn more about that a bit later on but radio, radium bromide is a radioactive substance and the thing is it emits what are called alpha particles or alpha rays. We'll find out what those are later as well. But he had a detector and the idea was that that detector would count the number of alpha particles hitting the detector per minute. And then what he did was to put a very very thin sheet of gold. It was a piece of gold foil rather like a Kit Kat wrapper but even thinner. So it's only a few atoms thick. And what he expected was that the alpha particles, when they hit the gold, would, because they're going through this plum pudding effect, they're hitting, as it were, solid, positively charged, um, uh, doughy type of atoms with a few negative things in the middle. He expected that there would be a minor diversion as the alpha particles hit those atoms. But what he actually got was a surprise. Overwhelmingly the alpha particles just went straight through. No diversion at all. But very occasionally an alpha particle would as it were bounce backwards. So he concluded that the plum pudding model couldn't be right and that there was a different model of the atom. And that was a model where if this is the atom all the positively charged bit was in a very small nucleus. And remember, the positively charged bit is overwhelmingly the mass of the atom. The negatively charged bit is only one two thousandth of the positively charged bit. Or to put it another way, the positively charged bit is 2,000 times more massive than the negatively charged bit. So Rutherford said all the positively charged bit is at the middle in the nucleus and the negatively charged bits orbit the nucleus rather like the earth orbits the sun. So these would be what we now call the electrons and this would now what we now call the nucleus. And he said that explains the experimental results that we see here because the rest of the atom would be completely empty. So if an alpha particle goes like this it's going to go straight through because it doesn't hit anything. If it goes like this, it's going to go straight through. If it goes like this, it's going to go straight through. Oh, and incidentally, the alpha particle we now know is made up of two protons and two neutrons, which makes it 8,000 times heavier than an electron. So if the alpha particle were to hit the electron, 
It would be rather like a bus hitting a fly. It wouldn't even notice, it would carry straight on. The only time the alpha particle is going to be affected is if it hits the nucleus and then it's going to rebound. And, and Rutherford was able to calculate the relative size of the nucleus to the atom by virtue of the proportion of alpha particles which were reflected. And what he found was that the nucleus was one ten thousandth of the diameter of the atom. So the diameter of the atom is approximately 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is pretty small, but the diameter of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 14 meters, which is 10,000 times smaller. To give you some kind of context, if you were to blow up the atom to the size of a room, then the nucleus would be a grain of rice in the middle of the room. Well, as I've said, we now know that the negatively charged bit is basically electrons. And we now know that the positive nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, neutrons have no charge. Electrons have a negative charge, and the charge on an electron is equal but opposite to the charge on a proton. And in order for an atom to be neutral, you have to have the same number of protons to the number of... And it turns out that this is precisely what makes elements different. Elements are determined by the number of protons in their nucleus. And of course, the number of protons will always equal the number of electrons. So for example, if you have one proton in the nucleus, and only one, then that turns out to be the element hydrogen. If you have two protons, that is the element helium. If you have three, that is the element lithium. I won't do them all, but for example, if you have six, that's the element carbon. If you have seven, that's the element nitrogen. And if you have eight, that's the element oxygen. And you can go all the way up to having 92 protons in the nucleus, which means, of course, you also have to have 92 electrons orbiting. And that is the element uranium. And it turns out that if you go above 92, the atoms become very unstable and start to break up. And that's called radioactivity, and we'll come to that later. Well, many years have gone by since then, the electron, which is negatively charged, still remains a fundamental particle, by which I mean it's not made up of anything, or if it is, we haven't found out what it is. The electron is the smallest unit of the negatively charged bit of the atom. We used to think that the protons and the neutrons, proton, remember, is positively charged, the neutron isn't charged at all, it's neutral, we used to think that they were fundamentally fundamental particles. But we now know that they are made up of what are called quarks, or quarks. There's often a bit of a dispute about the uh, pronunciation. Should it be quark to rhyme with bark, or should it be quark to rhyme with cork? And there are two types of quark, an up and a down. Now, I don't actually mean by this that there's something physical that points up and something physical that points down. These are just names. They are labels. They're ways of distinguishing two different types of quark. One we call an up quark. One we call a down quark. An up quark has a charge of plus two thirds. So it's got a charge which is two thirds the value of that of a proton. A down quark has a charge of minus one-third, which means it has a charge which is a third of the value of an electron. They're both negative. And this is how it works. Two up quarks and a down quark make a proton. If you think about it, two charges of two-thirds is four-thirds, 
one minus third is four thirds minus a third gives you an overall charge of plus one. A neutron, on the other hand, is made of an up quark and two down quarks. So you've got plus two thirds, minus a third, minus a third, that's a neutron, and the overall charge is zero. Plus two thirds, minus a third, minus a third. But please note, quarks do not make up electrons. They only make up protons and neutrons. Now you might notice that you can convert a proton to a neutron or a neutron to a proton simply by changing the middle quark. The outer two are the same, but if you take an up quark in a proton and turn it into a down quark, you make a neutron. Or if you take a down quark in a neutron and turn it into an up quark, you make a proton. But when you do that, you also emit other particles. So when a proton becomes a neutron, you also get what's called a positron and you get what's called a neutrino. So what is happening is that the proton, which is an up, up, down, becomes a neutron, which is an up, down, down. But the process of converting that up quark into that down quark has also produced a positron, which is an electron, but with a positive charge. It is what we call the antimatter version of the electron. If an electron and a positron meet, they will annihilate and just produce energy. And the neutrino is a ghostly, peculiar type of particle, which you don't need to know anything about, but it turns out it has to be there in order to make everything balance. And as we shall see later, this equation is what is happening inside the sun all the time. It's the main thing that happens in the sun. It's the main thing that provides the means by which the sun gives out energy. If you go the other way, if a neutron becomes a proton, then you also get an ordinary electron and an anti-neutrino, which is the antimatter equivalent of the neutrino above. And what's happened here is that an up, down, down has become an up, up, down. And the process of changing the down into an up has also produced an ordinary electron and an anti-neutrino. You'll also see that it's important to produce these electrons because you've got to conserve the charge. You start with a positively charged proton and you produce a neutral neutron, where does the positive charge go? Answer, it's carried away by this positively charged electron. Similarly, you start with a neutral neutron and you produce a positively charged proton. How can you make the charge balance? By also creating a negatively charged electron so that the positive and negatively charged particles together produce a neutral charge. So if we just review the electron, the proton and the neutron in terms of their mass, their charge and the number of quarks, we're going to look at a proton, a neutron and an electron. If we give the proton a mass one, if that is its kind of uh, unitary value, then a neutron will have the same mass. It's about the same. There's a slight difference, but it's about the same. Whereas I've said before, the electron will be one two thousandth the value of the mass of the proton. The charge of a proton is plus one. The charge of a neutron, of course, is zero. It has no charge. And the charge of an electron is minus one. So the electron charge is equal and opposite to the charge on the proton, even though the electron is so much less massive than the proton. And in terms of quarks, the proton is made up of two ups and a down. The neutron is made up of an up and two downs. And remember, the electron is not made of quarks at all. Now, you might think that the mass of a proton would be equal to three times the mass of a quark, because there are three quarks in a proton. But in fact, the mass of a proton is hugely bigger 
than the mass of a quark, certainly much more than three times. And this is all down to what is called quark confinement. You are confining three quarks into a proton, and a proton has an, a diameter of about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So you're confining three particles that want to be very energetic, and that energy of confinement is translated into the mass of the proton. We've spoken in several videos in this series about an electron being kicked out of the atom. So now you perhaps get a better idea of what we're talking about. We've got this positively charged nucleus, which will have a number of protons in it. Those pro that, it's that number of protons determines what element we're talking about, as we've said and you've got the same number of electrons orbiting. And they, it turns out, orbit in different orbitals. But the electron that's in the outer orbit is the one that's most loosely bound to the nucleus because it's furthest away. And if that electron gets hit by a photon or maybe even another electron and it's given enough energy, you can kick that electron out of the atom completely. And if you kick it out, it means that there's now one more proton than there were electrons. So there is a net positive charge on this atom. And it's said to be ionized, which simply means it's lost one of its electrons and there's now a net positive charge because however many protons there were, there used to be exactly the same number of electrons, but if you lose one electron, you've now got one more proton than you have electrons. So there's a net positive charge on that now ionized atom.